Okay, then let's make a start on the next session. Um, this session will be about um, bending and shear, and um, it also says and axial load at the end there. Um, and if you look at the notes, um, you will find that there are there is a section on bending shear and axial load. But I think I'll probably skip over those few slides because it just starts getting slightly ridiculous, and um, it, it's it's very difficult to try to explain it so that other people actually understand it. So I think we'll concentrate on the bending and shear and the bending and axial load and I'll leave you to look up the interaction between bending shear and axial load later on because it, it, it's, just, it's just better to get your head around it that way. Okay, so starting off with bending and shear. Um, basically, um, the shear force is acting on a steel section can reduce the bending resistance of the section if the shear force is large enough and Therefore, it's necessary to consider the interaction between um, these two actions. Um, the interaction will depend on two different things. Um, first of all, the class of the section. And second of all, um, whether the section is susceptible or not um, to shear buckling. <coughs> um, the plastic moment resistance is used even for class 3 and 4 um, sections. And that's basically because the testing that's been done has shown that the reduction due to the shear on the actual moment um, resistance is actually very, very small. Um, so this is one of the areas where you will actually find a big benefit um, using the Eurocodes compared to the BS5400 approach. You'll, you'll get a lot more out of your shear um, moment interaction than you would have done to BS5400. And um, this is also quite useful if you're doing a sort of strengthening scheme or uh, we have used it quite a lot for assessments and things like that as well. Um, it's, it's proved to be quite, use, use, uh, quite a useful um, tool to use. Um, the first thing we'll do now is we'll start off looking at class 1 and 2 sections and we'll consider a case where we don't have any shear buckling. And basically it's the sort of easiest um, case to start considering. And basically if the shear force is less than half the plastic shear resistance, um, you don't have any interaction at all with the moment. Um, if you have a shear force that's greater than half the plastic shear resistance, um, then you have to um, allow for some interaction with the section. And um, you, you need to take that into account by reducing the yield, strength, yield stress in the section um, for the bending calculation. And you do that by applying these two formula there. And that just acts essentially as a reduction factor onto the um, bending resistance. Um, this VED factor is an applied shear force. Um, the VPL is just the plastic um, shear resistance. <coughs> um, alternatively, you can use the second formula shown there, which is essentially just reducing the web strength. Um, and potentially, you could just reduce the thickness of the web by the same sort of factor. So there's a couple of different ways you can sort of reduce um, the web strength and take into account the interaction. <coughs> Um, however, once you've sort of started reducing web thicknesses and things like that, you shouldn't then go back and reclassify the section. Um, you, you should just use those, uh, that um, section for this um, interaction only. You don't go and redo any of the rest of the calculations in there. Um, the code does give some um, simple formula for equal flanges and um, sort of simple I-beams. Um, but if you have a typical bridge, it's not very often that you've got an isometric beam. Um, they just don't seem to happen very much in bridges. Um, so that's more applicable for building design, really. In, if you're dealing with bridges, you have to um, sort of use a revised plastic resistance moment. And that's, found, that's um, just found by determining the plastic um, neutral axis and calculating the moment resistance about um, that act about that axis for the reduced um, so the section properties that you calculated um, there. So it's a little bit more calculation if you don't have a symmetrical section, but generally speaking, it's kind of what you're stuck with if you're doing a bridge design. Okay, um, so this slide here will then just show you the interaction between um, this moment and the shear. Um, and as you can see, um, there isn't actually that much um, interaction between the two. Um, <coughs> Well, below the half the plastic resistance, you have no um, interaction. And below the plastic bending resistance, you don't have any interaction either. It's just in this zone in there where you do have um, some interaction. And that interaction is um, quite a lot more 
uh, uh, quite a lot better than it is in BS 500. The difference is less for class 1 and 2 sections, um, but it's, it's bigger um, as we go along, and I'll, I'll sort of show you the diagrams um, later on for the other sections. Um, for the class 3 section, um, again, as I said, the, norm, the, um, the, sort of the diagram is based on the plastic moment resistance even though it's the um, elastic resistance that will govern your um, sort of the, the moment design within that section. But um, as you can see, um, once you actually, if you have the mo elastic moment resistance, you just draw a vertical line up to where that um, line uh, intersects the interaction curve, and that's then the interaction that you get. Um, if you had BS5400, the interaction would be basically draw a straight line between um, the plastic shear resistance point up there and the elastic moment resistance there, and you'd end up with a lot less um, allowance for interaction in that region there. And as I said, um, this has been proven through quite a lot of testing, so it is um, quite safe. Um, and it's just based on sort of The, the stuff that's being done uh, much more recently than when BS5400 was written. <coughs> um, if you do have um, shear buckling within the section, um, there you have slightly different um, interaction criteria that apply. Um, and basically here again, um, if the shear force is less than half the web, buck web shear buckling resistance, you don't have any shear interac or any interaction between the moment and the shear. But if the shear force is greater than half the web shear buckling resistance, um, you do have an interaction. And the interaction is then shown in this equation there on the slide. And um, you have to apply um, these different ra um, ratios. So you've got the N1 bar is the ratio on for the moment resistance. And the N three bar is the sort of interaction from the shear resistance. And you then you take that and then use that to sort of develop your um, interaction curve. Um, uh, the full shear web shear resistance contribution is um, then just obtained for the moment of where the moment is less than MF comma R D. Um, and the actual interaction that you get is then shown on this um, diagram here. So as you can see, um, it is a little bit different from the section where we had no shear buckling because you've got a bit of a curve to um, the to this part of the curve, a bit of a curve up here. Um, but otherwise, it's essentially a very similar interaction and using sort of slightly different um, numbers. Mm -hmm. But again, um, you do get quite a lot more benefit than what you had. Um, for BS5400. <coughs> and that's just a diagram there for the class 1 and 2 sections. Um, the class um, 3 section is derived in exactly the same way. It's only that um, instead of use, extending the curve out to the plastic moment resistance, you just curtail it at the elastic moment resistance of the section. Um, <coughs> and the same thing is done if you're using a class 4 section as well. Only difference is for class four section um, that that you base the sort of resistance for the moment on um, the sort of MPL comma RD and MF comma RD uh, on the gross web area and the reduced um, flange area within the sections. Um, and as I said previously. Pretty much all these curves that you've seen um, on these couple of slides are, will give you a better interaction than the ones that you would have seen in BS5400. Um, so it, it is really a very useful tool to be sort of getting that extra bit of capacity out of something. And um, we found it particularly useful for assessment and strengthening schemes, um, where particularly for strengthening scheme where you've sort of found you need a whole bunch of extra stiffness to to strengthen up a web in an old box girder or something, you start applying these equations and suddenly you can get rid of a lot of the interaction um, requirements and you can therefore get, um, you, you can therefore reach a point where you don't have to do nearly as much strengthening on the section. <coughs>
so um, clients quite like um, you using this sort of this sort of stuff. Um, the Eurocode does not require the interaction between bending and shear buckling to be verified at sections nearer than um, the height of the web divided by two to a support um, if you've got a bearing stiffener. And um, basically the reason for that is that um, the chance of buckling very close to a stiffener is very, very low. It generally, generally speaking, um, a steel plate will not buckle immediately adjacent to a stiffener. Um, it'll start buckling sort of further away from it. And the Eurocode states that um, the, the area where it starts being uh, susceptible to buckling is the height of the web divided by um, two. So it's basically, um, you have to check web buckling at that point there. Oh, you don't have to check it at that point there. Again, that's another area where you can get um, some benefit out of um, the code. Um, you will still need to check the interaction at the support for um, the plastic shear resistance though, and you have to base it on full um, plastic shear resistance there, because um, the effects um, are still there. Uh, it's, just a, it's just the buckling effects that you can um, sort of check uh, further away from the section. Um, for a composite section um, with a class one or two section, um, the interaction is considered by reducing the web area even where there is a shear buckling. And this differs slightly from the approach for pure steel sections, which um, uses that interaction formula instead. Um, in practice, though, uh, even though the methodology looks slightly different, um, it doesn't really give any different answers. It gives you pretty much the same sort of result. Um, this slide here goes through um, class three and four sections, and um, it's not actually correct anymore. Um, there's been a, uh, an amendment to um, Eurocode 4 that's come out, and I think it was, came out a couple of months ago, um, that basically makes this um, slide um, redundant. It's no longer accurate. And um, the part of the Thomas Telford guide that discusses this is also not accurate because it was written for the, um, the code before it was amended. So um, that's quite an important thing to note. So basically everything on that slide is, is not really correct anymore. Um, and instead of modifying the moment in the way that's sort of mentioned on this, you just use the full actual moment within the section. Um, so Again, just something to um, make sure you're aware of, and when you do come to that part of the Thomas Telford Guide, to write yourself a note to say this is no longer what we're doing, because uh, um, the code's been modified since then. Okay, the flanges in the box girders. Um, this, the equation that's shown up there um, can also be used to verify the flanges in box girders, and um, it is exactly the same interaction formula that we were looking at sort of earlier. Um, the difference here is that um, MF comma RD um, is, should be taken as equal to zero. And basically that just means that the webs are not allowed to increase the shear strength. Um, the N1 bar is um, modified by, is replaced by N1. Um, again, th there's no actual test um, evidence to suggest that the plastic bending resistance can be used when checking the, a wide flange. Um, and that's why it's been replaced. And um, the N3 bar value um, is determined as the greater value obtained from overall flange shear buckling or for the subpanel buckling. And again, that's just shown on this slide here. <coughs> um, now going on to look at bending and axial force um, within the section. Um, generally speaking, um, the presence of axial force will reduce the ultimate bending res resistance of a cross section. Um, where the parts that contribute to the bending resistance are also required to resist the um, axial force as well. Um, if you do have an axial force, it is important to be consistent between the global analysis and the cross-section design, uh, particularly with respect to the height at which the axial force is assumed to act. Um, if the axial force is acting slightly eccentric eccentrically to the centroid, um, you will end up with additional moments um, being caused by that axial load. and those um, moments do have to be taken into account um, in the design. Um, if you are using a uh, plastic design to derive an overall stress block within the section, um, it may sometimes be preferable to refer 
to refer the axial force to the plastic neutral axis obtained in the absence of an axial force. But again, the method of the interaction will be very dependent on the class of the cross-section and it will vary depending on if you've got a class 1 and 2 or 3 or 4 type cross-section. Um, for the class 1 and 2 sections, they're fully plastic, um, but generally speaking, they won't be very common in bridge design. We generally end up with um, class 3 and 4 um, sections. However, the class 1 and 2 sections can de develop full plastic elasticity throughout the entire depth of the section and that complicates the check of the cross section as the stresses from the bending and the axial force can't simply be superimposed if advantage is to be taken of the plasticity within the section. Instead to calculate the reduced plastic bending resistance where there's axial load present um, you need to calculate um, this MN comma RD factor and basically that is just um, the MPL comma RD, which is the plastic moment resistance of the full section, minus MPL comma X, which is just the plastic moment resistance of the section component, which is resisting the axial force, and you then use that um, in your um, design. Um, the code does give some formula for the rectangular sections and beams with equal flanges, but again, it's not very common to have um, symmetrical sections for a bridge, and um, so now we'll just go over a bit more of the general method, um, which, is, which, which can be applied um, to bridge members in particular. <coughs> um, so in cases where you've got a non-symmetrical um, section, you have to consider where the axial force determined from the global analysis is assumed to act. And this is particularly important as the elastic and the plastic bending neutral axis won't be at the same location for um, for the, um, the cross-section. Um, using this method, um, the axial force is assumed to act at the plastic neutral axis in the absence of an axial force. Um, if it acted at the elastic neutral axis, an additional moment would then need to be considered for the global analysis of the section, um, which would make things a little bit more complicated yet again. So do make sure that you apply it at the plastic neutral axis. Um, for this, um, you calculate what well, depth a, um, and that is just determined such that um, NED is equal to the height, which is A, um, times 2 times the yield, times the yield strength of um, the steel. Um, the next thing we have to do is um, calculate the moment resistance, um, and that's defined as M2, comma FYD. Um, the reduced plastic resistance is then calculated, um, and that's just this MN, comma RD that we were discussing a bit earlier which is just the plastic resistance minus um, M2 FYD um, that we said. Um, once you've done this, it's important to check that the, the section is still a, a class 1 or 2 section um, using the, the new plastic stress block because um, otherwise you'll have to um, consider it as a class 3 or 4 section depending on, on what the reclassification of the section shows. Um, in a lot of um, practical cases, um, the steel section will be subject to axial force as well as bending about both the axes within the system. So you'll have biaxial bending as well as the axial load acting on the section. And um, calculating um, calculation of the collapse load is also complicated by um, the addition of moments about both, um, both axes. Um, for this calculation, we can use the same principles as we've been through um, over the last couple of slides where we just reduce the moment resistance by removing components to reduce uh, to, to resist both the axial load and the biaxial moment. And um, there is a formula that is provided in the code and that's the one shown on this slide here. Um, and basically that just takes the applied moments in each direction and divides them by the plastic resistance um, in that direction as well. And then this plastic resistance is then the resist resistance that has been reduced for the axial load as well. The alpha and beta constants that are given up there can conservatively be um, used as one. Um, or you can calculate them in a bit more detail. Um, the code does give some um, values for sort of typical cross sections of so I, I beams and H beams and channels and RHSs. But again, they're probably not very useful if you're doing a bridge design because we don't use them very often. We tend to have more complex sort of um, structures.
or in more complex geometries. Um, if you want to avoid the complexity of um, calculating the plastic stress block for the bending and axial force, um, there, are, there is a simplified linear interaction that you can use, um, and that's also given in the code um, by um, that sort of equation shown there. And um, if you've been using BS5400 previously, it'd be quite familiar because it's pretty much the same interaction curve. <coughs> um, if you've got a separate, a separate um, section classification t um, that you've done, um, you need to determine the plastic stress block. And um, it's quite often that if you sort of do a sort of separate calculation for the bending alone and the axial load alone, you find that um, the section will quite likely be a class one or two section for bending, but it'll be a class three or four section for the axial load. And um, you do need to take that in, into account um, when you um, do the calculation. Um, because in, in the event where you have a three, class three or four section for the axial load, you can no longer use this simple interaction um, formula. And you have to do some more um, complicated um, equations and you have to start determining um, the actual stress block that you get under both the combined axial load and, and moment um, that you have within the section. And you, you could potentially end up having to reclassify this um, section. <coughs> um, for class 3 sections, um, these are a lot more susceptible to um, local buckling. Uh, <coughs> and the plastic interactions of axial force and bending moment um, that we were discussing for the class 1 and 2 sections um, can't be applied for the class um, 3 sections. Um, it, instead of those formula, you have a simple superposition of elastic stresses and uh, the resulting stress limited is limited to the design yield strength at all locations within the beam and that's just in accordance with the equation shown on this slide here. And um, in cases where you've got biaxial bending, um, you've got this um, interaction formula shown on the right-hand side there, um, where, you, where it's just dependent on the applied moment and um, the section, resist, section modulus is in each of the directions that you're looking at. And of course, um, the axial load and area of that, of that section. W is essentially Z. They um, you will find when you go through the Eurocodes that um, some of the things have been changed, some of the, the letters. Um, I think R is now I and things like that as well. It's, it's a little things that have changed that can be slightly annoying because you no longer know what they are. But, and, and that is one of them. W is said essentially. Um, if you've got a class 4 um, cross-section, um, these are treated in a very similar way to class three sections, but um, you use the effective um, section for the plate buckling. Um, your effective area and section modulus can be derived separately for the axial force and bending, or they can be derived for the combined um, stress uh, distribution. If you are deriving it from the combined stress distribution, um, it will typically not be very practical, as it will require recalculation of the section properties for every different node case that you've got, and um, the it basically means you'd have to do quite a lot of iteration. Um, it could potentially give you some increase in the economy there because it um, gives you more accurate um, answers and is quite conservative as, as quite as conservative as, as other methods. And if you've got a spreadsheet or something like that, it may not be um, that difficult to do. <coughs> um, and generally speaking, um, that the formula given here are the ones that are used for the interaction formula. Um, and again, there's a, sort of a component in there that takes into account the eccentricity of the axial load on the section um, and I just adds it on to the moment uh, on, on the moment resistance of that section. Um, if the stress varies along the length of the panel, the verifications can be, produ um, can be done at a distance of 0.4a or 0.5b from the panel end. Um, but it, you also need to look at um, sort of the section at um, the actual support where you using the gross section properties and basically it's sort of a similar thing as we were discussing previously. Um, it's not very likely to buckle 
if you've got put a restraint in, also such as a stiffener. So it, you are allowed to move a certain distance away um, just to check that, um, and just check the section there for the buckling. But you have to check, um, you have to check it at section A using the gross section properties as well if you are going to use that approach because that could potentially be slightly worse. Okay, the next session here is the bending shear and axial load. And as I said, in the beginning of this presentation. I won't actually go over any of this in any detail whatsoever. Um, it's much better if you um, take it away and look at it yourself because it is quite involved and it's very difficult to explain trying to get all these different effects in together. Um, it's, it's basically there so you have an awareness that it, it does exist and you do need to take it into account um, when you do the calculations. So I'll just skip over these um, slides here and skip straight to the summary slide at the end. Um, and this summary slide is quite useful really because it tells you um, which clauses most things are actually considered in. So if you are um, <laughs> if you are looking at a class one or two section, it tells you which clauses you have to go to if you're looking at shear buckling, and it tells you which clauses to go to if, you're not look, uh, if you don't have any um, shear buckling, and then tells you what the interaction formula for bending and shear, bending and axial load, and bending, shear, and axial load. So it's quite a good this is a summary, summary sheet, really, and just gives you some useful information aware in the code um, to look for things. 